place to hide the truth is in the pages of a book. just read maybe we should just read reviews good evening hello how's it going out there i hope you can hear me i hope there's some sound coming through let me know in the chat if that is so i can see we've got peter gwen and richard here and adam how's it going welcome back haven't been here for a while i feel a bit out of practice but uh we have got a new schedule and we're gonna dive right back in tonight continuing with the story of the rockefeller foundation um, I'm excited to get back into this book. I feel like, um, you know, cause I can't continue the reading cause I'm doing it on a live stream and I've got a, we've got a little thing going with the, with the live audience here. You know, I have to, I have to wait until I'm able to live stream in order to carry on with the book. <laughs> so I've been itching to learn more, but having to wait until I had an opportunity to, uh, to get a stream up and running. Uh, but it looks like we are good. The audio is good and the visual is good. So that is fantastic. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, we have made it through the first three months of the year, hopefully for you all relatively unscathed, uh, although it is quite crazy out there. But what we like to do here is step away from the craziness and that sort of never ending bombardment of uh, incredible news stories and attention grabbing headlines and uh, bite sized chunks of information that are just designed to keep you uh, off kilter and stressed and worried and anxious. And uh, we step away from that. And then we take a bit of time to relax into a slower pace where we can read and do some learning and not be so frantic and not worry so much about keeping up with every single little development as it unfolds, because that can be very addictive. You know, information addiction is a real thing. I've certainly had my own battles with that uh, in the past and on ongoing, I must say. Um, I tend to find it very difficult to to step away and just uh, put my phone down, take my earphones out uh, and, uh, you know, go for a walk and do something other than uh, just greedily harvest and and, and uh, consume information. And so I think I like to think what I'm doing here is a slower pace, 
for people who are trying to go at a more leisurely uh, sort of way into into this kind of information and not be so alarmed and stressed and bombarded by the the uh, the the just constant stream of information that is coming at us out there. Um, so it's good to have you back, whether you're here live or watching on the replay. I've been busy behind the scenes uh, working on the waiting screen and the little intro video there that I just played. So I uh, hope you enjoyed those. Um, it's, uh, it's all good fun and it's been a learning process for me. And I put all of that together apart from one clip in the middle, which I uh, got of Richard Grove saying, maybe we should just read. <laughs> Because I think in a sentence that really captures what I'm all about here on this channel and what I'm trying to do and spread to other people. The message is maybe we should just read. Maybe we should turn the television off, turn the news off, turn the social media off, turn the Wi-Fi off, right? Pick up a book and just read and uh, go back to basics, back to the old way of doing it. You, you, you exercise your mind in a way that is so powerful when you read a book. Uh, even I, and you know, I'm, I'm doing this podcast. I'm running the channel, but I don't consider myself to be an academic level expert who is uh, great at this. <laughs> I just know and recognize that the way information is stored and delivered in books is is a lot more valuable to us uh, than the sort of uh, concentrated dose that we get through our screens and electronic media and digital devices. Uh, it can be an incredible boon to have access to such information and be able to get it uh, in such a concentrated form. But I think ultimately the the payoff, the the downside is is quite harmful in, and that's in terms of attention span, in terms of how addictive uh, these devices become because of the dopamine and serotonin responses that become linked into their use. And I think books are a really nice way to uh, hedge against that and to exercise our brains and our minds and our memory and our imagination and our ability to recall information and to as well put our own information together if, when we're talking to other people. Because when you're reading a book, you're reading all these words, sentences, paragraphs, chapters, and it teaches you and trains you to think in a, in a way that is more complex and nuanced and so that you can link ideas and information together to form coherent arguments and explanations and, and narratives even for when you're talking to other people out there. So it's an incredibly valuable thing to do. Uh, there seems, from my point of view, there's never been a better time to stock up on books because uh, they're quite abundant and they're all over the place and they're you know relatively cheap depending on what you're going for. Uh, and so that's why uh, I got Richard's permission to include that little clip there in the intro music. So I hope you enjoyed that and that went down well. So that's uh, a little bit of an intro, uh, a little bit of an explanation about where I've been, but I'm happy to be back. Uh, I'm going to be streaming uh, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Uh, that is the plan moving forward. So keep an eye out for, for those. Uh, every Tuesday and Thursday is going to be uh, reading. Uh, and then Wednesdays will be, not every Wednesday, but there'll be something happening on Wednesdays as well. But uh, watch that, watch this space, watch that, uh, watch that space, this space <laughs> uh, for more information on that. So let's uh, go into today's sort of preamble, which I have prepared lovingly, but it's mainly, uh, it's mainly resources for further, further education and fleshing out of the um, context around the, the topic that the book relates to. And so the first thing I wanted to uh, let you all know about is this podcast from Courtney Turner. So Courtney Turner is a podcaster, obviously. She has an incredible story, an incredible uh, hero's journey to uh, from the, that literally goes back to her birth up to the present day, uh, the things she's done, the places she's been, uh, the adventures she's been on. She's a fellow book nerd. And she has wonderful guests and incredible conversations. And she's collaborated with the likes of Jay Dyer uh, and Richard Grove. She was in the most recent VIP Summit 3. And there's a link to that in the description under my video. Uh, and uh, you can hear her uh, being interviewed by Richard and talking about what it takes to be a content producer and to be educating people. And unfortunately, I found out recently as well that her YouTube channel has been nuked. <laughs> And I don't think it's her first one. I think uh, this has happened to her before, but I was looking for this conversation, in fact, uh, on YouTube and it's gone and the channel's gone. It violates our community standards or whatever. So, um, you know, she's uh, she's a right above the target, if that's the case. <laughs> uh, and this one popped out to me because it is specifically 
dealing with the topic that we're learning about in this series of videos, reading from the Fosdick book. So this is a deep dive into Rockefeller Medicine, Courtney Turner and Miriam Henine. Uh, and I thought I would put that on your radar. So for further learning for people who uh, want to flesh out, because what we're getting in this book, this is the the sanitized approved narrative that they're happy to tell people about. So it's not going to include all the, the um, sort of things that tarnish their reputation, the things, the, the underhand, dirty, dastardly sort of dealings that they're, they're involved in. This is going to be the, the kind of praise John D. Rockefeller. What a wonderful man he was. Look at his face though. <laughs> he looks almost skeletal. He looks like a mummy. They dug him out of a sarcophagus in Egypt or something, which, which wouldn't surprise me, but there'll be a link to this podcast underneath uh, the video. Uh, after we finish broadcasting. So I wanted to let you know, and uh, this video is worth a listen and just Courtney in general, it, her, her, her work's really good. So I would recommend her and you'll, you can't find her on YouTube now, so you'll have to go to her website, but that's good for her because that helps support the people who do this kind of work, which uh, is very much needed. Okay, moving on a little bit. Uh, so one of the topics that's come up while we've been reading this book is this issue of the World Health Organization and the kind of power grab, the, uh, the 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 treaty, the pandemic treaty that they're trying to ratify and push through, which is going to be a legally binding agreement to all the countries who sign up to it. Uh, here's a clip that I wanted to play of uh, Dr. David Martin uh, describing what's at stake because the Rockefeller Foundation is very, we're learning in this book, very intimately tied to this established global health order. Uh, of this this paradigm which we now live within and is let's face it making a lot of people sick harming a lot of people if not responsible for the deaths of many many people uh, so it's a faulty paradigm we're not getting healthier we're not getting uh, fitter and stronger we're not getting on mass um, a higher quality of life thanks to this this system which is rolled out all over the world and what we find is the Rockefellers were, were there at the beginning when the WHO was being founded and when things like the United Nations uh, were, were being established, they were there and they were involved in it. And so what is the current day, the present day effect of the actions in the past of, of the Rockefellers? Well, this is one of them. And this is a huge issue that we're facing right now. And I mentioned pre in a previous video, the Lawyers for Light, who are doing a little fundraiser in order to challenge the WHO's pandemic treaty on behalf of us Brits. Uh, and so this is just a little clip that, that I thought goes well, goes pretty well, a good summary into uh, why we should care about this uh, pandemic treaty. You can't hear that, can you? So what I need to do is press this button here so you will be able to hear it. Can you give an uh, outline to the viewers who might not be aware of it? What this WHO international treaty that's uh, currently being ironed out over at the UN, what, what is it all about? Well, the key points are that with the support of the financial institutions of the Rockefeller Foundation, the Wellcome Trust and the Gates Foundation, we're essentially ceding the ability to suspend all civil liberties and all of the rights associated with what we would call the Bill of Rights here in the United States, International Declaration of Human Rights. All of those can be suspended by a capricious determination that there's a public health emergency. And the minute that happens, there are no rights. In a nutshell, that's what the treaty is. And like the PREP Act was after the anthrax outbreak of 2001, which the U.S. perpetrated on the U.S. so that we could get to the PREP Act of 2005, the exact same playbook is how we got COVID to get us to this moment, which is to say, terrorize the world, convince them that we need some giant protector state that actually has some sort of supranational ability, and then suspend civil liberties as long as they need to be suspended. And in this particular case, at the whim of funding agencies who have no criminal accountability. So in a nutshell, if you feel good about that, feel good about May. What it does is it allows a board at the World Health Organization to either declare an actual emergency or declare an anticipated emergency. There doesn't have to be any evidence. There is no evidence standard at all. So this is actually worse than what happened in COVID because they don't even have a standard that says they have to isolate a pathogen. They don't have to isolate anything. What they have to do is simply say, we think that there is a reason to declare an emergency. And as such, we therefore have the ability to suspend travel, to actually penalize member states. There's a very big clause inside of the treaty that actually has penalties on member states for noncompliance. But we have to go back to the formation of the World Health Organization. And a lot of people don't want to go back to 1944 to 1946 when the WHO was set up. Very few people know that they wrote absolute immunity from all criminal prosecution into their charter. I just wanted to pause it there because I was looking for this charter to find this quote and I could not find it. I could find a charter. I could find a WHO charter, but it, it didn't seem to have this quote in it. So I don't know if I'm looking at the wrong document or if somebody else can dig that up. There is no link underneath this video, unfortunately. 
And I also don't know so much about the credibility of Dr. David Martin. <laughs> he, he, uh, he looks a bit funny in his bow tie, but you know, there's nothing wrong with bow ties. If that's what you choose to wear, that in and of itself isn't a problem, but I just wanted to uh, mention that. The only organization self-appointed with no external authority ever granted to have the ability to write themselves out of all forms of criminal prosecution in perpetuity. That's right in the charter of the World Health Organization. And that right, which was actually negotiated by the Wellcome Trust and the Rockefeller Foundation, they are the ones that paid for it. They're the ones that put Renee Sand up as the first director. They're the ones that actually put all of these pieces in place. Give them the ability to act with impunity on citizens, regardless of your compliance or absence of compliance, with any of the nation-state decisions around the World Health Organization. Every American citizen traveling abroad has no rights. They can be subject to any crime for which there can be no criminal prosecution. So if you feel good about that, yeah, there's probably a way we can actually soft pedal this thing. But the problem is, like we had with anthrax to get to the PrEP Act, like we've had with COVID to get to the World Health Organization Treaty, these things are set up to be terror campaigns to modify the public's willingness to give up their liberties. Terror campaigns to modify the public's willingness to give up their liberties. Um, so I think very well said, very well spoken. Uh, I do think this character is interesting. I have no idea how legitimate he is, but I think in a nutshell, he definitely encapsulates why we should, if if not the the WHO, just be just be ultra hyper skeptical of any sort of international body that that raises itself above the nation state and and declares that it has the sort of agency to make these global level decisions. Because as we've read in the H.G. Wells book, in the Bertrand Russell book, we're kind of aware that there is a sort of one world government type plan afoot. And there's a long history of that, very well documented. And we talked about it in many ways. And we've got to look at the present day, uh, where it might come from. And things, organizations such as the WHO, such as the uh, UN, uh, UNICEF, these kind of um, entities, they look like a pretty, pretty strong candidate. Let's just say that. Uh, and so here again is the uh, crowd justice fundraiser for the Lawyers of Light who are, who are suggesting they're going to put together um, a uh, a case for to help the UK reject and exit the WHO, which I don't think would be a bad thing. Uh, they're not doing that well, though. <laughs> uh, so maybe throw a few quid their way if you like what they're doing. Uh, they've put some updates up. You can learn about it all here. We had a look at it on a previous video, so I won't go through that again. But that link is under my video to have a look if you are interested in. Okay, so this next bit I wanted to uh, bring in because I had a comment from a uh, I don't know the name of the YouTuber. It was something Wolf, Sith Wolf, Sith, Sith Wolf. <laughs> um, and they, they, were, they were challenging my one of my videos, uh, uh, one of my comments about the use of the word theory. And I was saying the germ theory and the theory of evolution. And I was uh, saying that, you know, a theory isn't an established fact. Uh, and he was saying that this was kind of a underhand tactic for a, uh, science denier. I think, I think this person called me a science denier or something or some sort of denier. And, uh, because I was questioning the use of this word theory and, you know, I will grant that, uh, a scientific theory is considered to be uh, a lot more robust than what you might think of just a theory on something. You know, if you have uh, a theory about a film you're watching, but I still think that the word theory is important to, uh, to focus in on, right? And then I came across this gentleman, uh, I can't remember his name, but he has this channel Beyond Terrain, and he put this helpful video out, which is about laws, models, hypotheses, and theories, and uh, and how they all relate and interrelate, and what the differences are between these four things. So you might guess from this gentleman's channel, <laughs> Beyond Terrain, which side of the, uh, the germ theory versus terrain theory debate he has found himself. But I like that he goes into the reasoning and the the actual the, the 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 reasons why the explanations why he's looking at these kind of things laws models hypotheses and theories and so there's a clip of this video that i wanted to play which is just uh you can see here it's divided we've got hypotheses there's a good 14 minutes on that and then this section here is about theories and i wanted to play that because i think it uh summarizes really well like uh, how to think of this word theory. And I will sort of stand corrected and say, yeah, you shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater just because it has the word theory attached to it. But, but let's watch what this guy has to say and, uh, and see what you think. So let me just mute me. We're going to be talking about theories. And in theory, the generation of theories comes from hypothesis. It comes from inductive reasoning. We'll touch more on that in a moment here. But theory 
I liken it to the scientific consensus. And, and it, in general, the theory is an explanation of the natural world. So a theory is a general explanation. It's very general. Hypotheses are very specific. And theories are very general. General explanation. So, of course, we go from hypotheses to theories. They are representations of the scientific consensus. And the last thing I'll say here is that they're built over time. And so, generally, this is, this is how it goes, right? So, you go from conducting a, a plethora of experiments, you bundle them all up, and you create a theory. And this is, makes sense, right? Of course, it relies on the quality of your experiments. It relies on the quality, in this case, of the scientific literature. Because in, in theory, this is a great way to generate theories based on a, a number of experiments. So it's also claimed in kind of the scientific communities and the scientific method itself that not only are they built over time, but they're reviewed and renewed over time as well. So they're, they get refined over time. And I mean, like again, this is good, right? New data should be able to come out and challenge theories. And, and when new true data comes out, it should be implemented into that theory, right? They, the theories should be moving. They should be molding with experiments as they go, because this is the notion, right? We, can we conduct more experiments all the time. We test new hypotheses, and, you know, multiple experiments now are needed to test one hypothesis for some reason, and, and essentially what we need is multiple hypotheses to generate a theory. And, of course, refinement is important here. When new data comes out that's reproduced, that we know is factual, that we know is true, this is when we need to revamp the theory itself. So I really like that point that he's making there, which is that these theories should be updated constantly and they should be added to and expanded and changed and, and challenged. But I think in many cases, and he's about to say this next in, in this next point, that doesn't happen. Uh, but I think that's a really key part to, to remember and that how the theories that we've got and we're operating on, how old are they? Has there been any challenge to them? Uh, has there been some sort of... Uh, is there some history of one um, side being emphasized than another, for example, uh, which is quite quite a key question to ask, especially in relation to um, to the germ theory and terrain theory debate? Obviously, theories are extremely dogmatic now. A great example is the germ theory. Not they do not want to budge, right? They think that their experiments conducted are enough to prove the germ theory, but it's because we're dogmatically tied to the theories, because we learn these theories in school from a young age. We go through, we spend thousands and thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars on university, years of our lives, 10 years, 10, 12, 13 years by the time you get a PhD, by the time you get through grad school and through, you know, maybe uh, med school. And so we're so tied to these theories. It's, it, we're so dogmatic in our thinking that we don't want to accept new literature. We don't want to accept new data. We don't want to accept new explanations of the data. We don't want to accept any confounding variables that may have been present. And so dogma is a problem when it comes to theories. So dogma is a problem when it comes to theories. Uh, so I thought that was a very good key takeaway. Uh, and to, to just bear that in mind, you know, uh, I'm not trying to deceive anyone by questioning the word theory. I think we should question everything and that should always be the smart thing to do. Uh, but I like this guy and I like his video and I think he's trying to spin up this podcast. He's got a nice 560 subscribers, but, uh, I like, I like his old school style, you know, talking about books and, and kind of going to the old ways, uh, and slowing down a little bit. I like it. He's got a, his blackboard, his piece of chalk, and you can tell he's not reading from a script or anything. He's, he's trying to explain it in the moment. And I think he's authentic and genuine. So definitely worth keeping an eye on this guy and learning from him because I think he's certainly going to get more polished as he does more of these. And he's got a podcast and, but Great point there. Bear that in mind uh, that theories, at what point does a theory become a dogma that is just so, that becomes unquestionable uh, and, and, and how can we be sure that not, that we shouldn't be questioning that theory and that dogma, you know? So uh, great clip there. And I just wanted to throw that out to you and the link to that will be also under this video. So what else have we got? So a couple of articles here. Uh, this one is Live Blood Online. And uh, this is about pleomorphism and germ theory. So pleomorphism is a, is a key uh, aspect of this debate, which I came across, and it really helped me sort of tie some things together. 
So the pleomorphism and germ theory. So the, this paradigm developed by Louis Pasteur. So when so he's saying this paradigm, he's talking about monomorphism. So that still so the accepted biological paradigm today is monomorphism. A monomorphism is the idea that these uh, tiny invisible beings that live on us and within us and, and can make us sick and invade our body and make us sick, that they never change form. They have one form uh, and they are that form for the, for the duration of their life. The competing theory to that is pleomorphism, right? So the monomorphism is the paradigm developed by Louis Pasteur and other scientists states that all microorganisms only have one possible form and do not have the ability to evolve into different types of organisms. The germ theory followed, which states that specific diseases are caused by infection with specific microorganisms and are cured when the microorganisms have been destroyed. <laughs> it's always a warlike uh, type of thing uh, with these guys, isn't it? This led to the development and widespread use of antibiotics, animal testing, and many of the other atrocities of modern medicine. Pleomorphism, the polar opposite of monomorphism, was developed by scientists like Antoine Bechamp and Gunther Enderlein and states that microorganisms have various life cycles and stages of development that can range between viruses, bacteria, yeast, and fungi, depending on the type of microorganism and the environment it is presented with. So the person who left the comment challenging my, um, my, 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 and a comment commentary on the word theory said, well, how do you explain disease then? Why is there uh, bacteria at the, at the site of diseased tissue? Um, and the, the metaphor that I have for that is why is there fireman at a, at a burning building? You know, you, when you don't, you don't see firemen at the burning building and think, oh, they must have caused the fire, right? And I think the, the terrain theory and the terrain model and this pleomorphism model, that's a good metaphor to bear in mind for why the bacteria and the virus and the fungi uh, tend to be at, at these places when disease is present. And so last quote here, and this is a quote from Antoine Bechamp. What is interesting is that pleomorphism and its proponents has been entirely written out of history books and encyclopedias and is not as much mentioned even for historical interest in universities and training institutions. So actually that's not a quote by Antoine Bechamp, sorry. I think this next section is about Antoine Bechamp. That's just a, an important quote from the writer of this article. And then, and then it goes on to tell you about some of these people so you can learn a little bit about them. Claude Bernard, Royal Raymond Reif, uh, incredible. His work is so interesting. Uh, he is basically using radio waves and sound waves to cure people. Gunther Enderlein, all these guys just, just written out of the books. So not, so the next question is like, well, who wrote the books? <laughs> so that's another interesting article there uh, for you to explore and learn from. Uh, and then this is another one about, uh, tells you a little bit more about pleomorphism, gives you a, a nice little diagram, which, uh, which um, I have a bigger copy of on the next page. But again, pleomorphism is the ability of microbes to change into many varied forms in a developmental cycle, depending on the conditions of the environment. Pleomorphism provides a much more complete view than monomorphism, which is the foundation of modern medicine. The view that microorganisms are monomorphistic, i.e. as existing in one fixed and unchangeable form and therefore classifiable. As opposed to the short-term symptomatic and often suppressive medical interventions prevalent today, the symbiotic approach fosters long-term deep and regenerative methods of increasing health. So another interesting uh, resource for you there. Uh, and this video which is linked, has a very interesting title. <laughs> LCFR is controlled by the Rothschild family. Now, unfortunately, this video is uh, in German and I do not speak German, <laughs> but if anybody out there does, I'd be very interested to hear about the contents of uh, Prof Enderlein and what he's saying in this video. Uh, I did send it to a German friend of mine and I had to ask him to have a look at it, but I think he's super busy running his IT company. Uh, so maybe I'll give him a, bit, a little bit of a nudge uh, but I thought it was quite interesting that we saw the good old, the good old R's uh, showing up for this one, right? So, yeah, there's a few more resources, and here is the close-up of that that uh, that diagram, which tells shows you this life cycle. Okay, so you've got this uh, first stage somatids, which become spores and double spores, and then bacteria, and then further down here they become uh, a yeast. And then they're into their sort of uh, fungus form, the mycelial form. And then somewhere around here, I think they even do uh, virus form 
unless perhaps this somatids is is the virus form. Uh, but it, it, uh, just interesting concept, isn't it? And the and it's the it's sort of the idea that your body is so intuitively self healing and, and regenerative, and we know it is because you know your skin heals itself when you cut, and your nails grow back. And uh, your hair grows back. Well, mine doesn't, but <laughs> you see what I'm saying. There's a there's a regenerative thing going on. You can heal. Bones can can heal. Uh, so we know that our bodies regenerate and have a healing capacity. Uh, and so there's the idea that these uh, the role of these microorganisms is to assist in that healing. And so when we have uh, symptoms or some sort of uh, disease of some kind, what is actually happening is healing's taking place. But the modern medical system will tell you that you have to suppress the healing processes. So suppress the fever and suppress the inflammation by, you know, this this uh, this potion or this pill. Uh, and and actually, what you're doing there is you're 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 pouncing on the the healing process itself and interrupting and interfering with that. And so proper healing doesn't take place and you end up with these chronic long-term illnesses that never get sorted out. But I'm not a doctor. It's just my layman's sort of view and understanding of, of this, these sort of things. So moving on to the next one, uh, before we get into the book, uh, here is, uh, was, this is a book called the sleeper. This is the homepage of an author who's written a book called the sleeper agent. And this was uh, pointed out to me by Heidi, who I think is in the chat tonight. Thank you very much for putting this, uh, in, in the telegram group. Uh, because I actually have spoken to this guy and I know this author, uh, not in any great length, but I, I did speak to him when I first joined the autonomy course. Uh, he was in there and I didn't know he'd written this book. So I was very happy to find out that um, he'd, he'd done that. And this is the story and science of the great Im in in imitator antigens of biological warfare. And so I've, I've thrown this in here because I would like to um, balance things out because even though I lean you know terrain theory makes a lot of sense to me and I, I i like and i and um i like learning from the people who stand in that paradigm i do also think there's an incredibly massive amount of money being poured into the research you know of, of bioweapons and these tiny particles and and uh, grabbing them from animals and uh what, what is it called where they uh, uplift the capability of them uh, and in order to make them more deadly and more um, transmissible. Uh, I forget the, the technical term for that now. But that, that is a real thing. There are these bio labs all over the place and they are funded. And, uh, and so that is, you know, it's important not to be dogmatic and say it's all germ theory and terrain theory is complete nonsense. And it's also important not to do the other, the opposite of that and say it's just terrain theory and there's no dangerous germs and, and all germ theory is nonsense. And so I've, I've put this in here because I'm, I'm sure I haven't read the book, but I'm sure it would be a very, re, uh, very good resource because he's uh, a deep dive into the history of this biological warfare and these um, efforts to create, you know, um, specific uh, particles which might go after a certain race of people or a certain demographic uh, and you can see here that he even talked to Courtney Turner uh, and John O'Loughlin as well who, who's, uh, who's got the Macduff Lives channel uh, and he, I'm quite new to John's work but again thank you to Heidi for, for putting me on to uh, this gentleman because I think uh, he's doing really good stuff too he's got a lot of book reviews <laughs> which got banned from YouTube so they're on they're up on BitChute now uh, and so yeah, and here he is talking to Daniel Estulin, who we know has done uh, books on the Tavistock and the Bilderberg Group. Uh, and so I thought that was another one to give you. And he's definitely getting around there at the minute. Ripple Effect podcast as well. So a good place to learn if you are, you know, you, you want to get both sides of the things, right? You want to get both sides of the issue. And there's the germ theory, the terrain theory. So let's look at both and, and, and get educated. Um, this is Adam's page on the One Great Work Network, which is Mark Passio's project. So wealth of information and presentations there. Lots to dig into. Um, some book reviews as well. We got Propaganda by Edward Bernays. Uh, we got Alistair Crowley, Agent 666, and The Survival of the Wisest by Jonas Salk. So uh, he's, he's also into the books and, and reading and trying to teach people from the books too. So I think very much a resource worth checking out and a gentleman worth supporting. And if you do want to support him, he has a YouTube here um, with his interviews. And he also has, oh, I already told you about the Courtney Turner one, but you can buy his book. And if you do buy it, I would recommend buying it from the publisher Trine Day. Uh, Trine Day are um, an excellent 
uh, outfit over in America and they, they published Whitney Webb's book, for example. And they've got a, a wall of heroes and, and they specialize in books that don't get printed in the mainstream, but have very important information that, that people need to know about. And so uh, Trine Day is very much uh, a good website and a good place to, to get these kind of books that are, that are not going to be recommended to you by the Amazon algorithm, for example. Uh, so if you are going to buy that or you're interested in getting a copy, uh, definitely consider buying from Trine Day would be my advice because uh, they are good people and uh, they have a podcast as well. Uh, so plenty of stuff to explore and a really long, long a big back catalog of books. So that is that that links for that will be underneath uh, and just as a final point as well exosomes so back in the early days of the big c event in 2020 um, we had david ike was interviewed by london real and he was talking about these things called exosomes and he was saying that what was being seen in a microscope and labeled as a word that i probably shouldn't say if i don't want to get censored but you know the v word the, the virus, I'll, I'll go with Nigel's, Nigel's code word, the virus. <laughs> he said, actually, they're exosomes. And, the, and these exosomes play a, a role in the um, process that we were just talking about, the pleomorphism process. And so just as a, as a sort of experiment, I thought, well, he, 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 was, he was suggesting that the exosomes were what were really being seen and they, they weren't uh, virus particles. And so just as, a, as an interest, I thought, let's have a quick look. And you can see here, the exosomes are 30 to 150 nanometers. So they're very tiny. And the size of a virus is 20 to 800 nanometers. So kind of in the same range. I mean, the exosome is in the lower end of that range, but it is the same range, isn't it? So quite interesting, reasonable to think that the two might be one and the same or might be mistaken one for the other. Uh, but again, I'm a layman and I'm just kind of uh, finding my way through these sorts of topics. Uh, and I'm very glad to have you along for the ride. So that's my little uh, spiel, my little introduction spiel. And we will get into the book quick sharp. Uh, I'll just have a quick sip and then we'll check the comments. So... Oh, we've got loads of stuff going on in the comics. I don't think I'm going to be able to read all these out, so I hope you're all having a good time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yes, we've got loads of stuff going on down here. Gwen's here. Heidi's here. Peter. LJ. Adam. Gwen. Yeah, awesome. I don't think I have the time to read all these out. We've got to get on with the book, haven't we? <laughs> anyway, I hope you're all uh, enjoying yourselves in the chat there. So let's get into the book. That was quite a long intro, but... You know, I haven't done one of these for, uh, I think it was a week and a half ago when I last did one. So so that's what you get when I have some time off, isn't it? Okay, let's crack on. Rockefeller Foundation. So I'm quite excited about tonight's chapter because, there we go, because it's all about Rockefeller's interest in uh, China. Uh, and uh, I just had a quick look a uh, brief scan over the first page of this chapter that we're going to read tonight. And uh, yeah, quite an interesting revelation in the very in the very first sentence. So let's get right into this. This is chapter seven. And it is the Johns Hopkins of China. Historically, China shares with the International Health Division in being one of the two oldest interests of the Rockefeller Foundation and the foundation has spent more money in that country than in any other country except the United States. Oh, Peter's saying emergency backup. Yes, I'm recording all of these uh, to my machine uh, where I have them ready to be uh, hand-braked down into a smaller size and then re-uploaded to other websites. I think that's what you're asking about. Um, yeah, so how about that? First sentence. So China is one of the two oldest interests of the Rockefeller Foundation, and it has more, uh, the foundation spent more money there than any other country besides the United States. So how about that? Quite an interesting revelation. Why would a philanthropic foundation uh, born and raised in America through and through who just cared so much about the nation's people that the patriarch of the foundation would walk around giving money to uh, children in the streets, but only when there were phot photographers nearby. 
why would they be investing so much and caring so much about pouring money into China? Let's find out. It was, as usual, Mr. Gates who initiated the development, although his ideas were undoubtedly influenced by his long contact with Mr. Rockefeller's interests in church missions in the Far East. The plan, as Mr. Gates first conceived it, before the Rockefeller Foundation was established, involved the creation of a great university in China dedicated to higher education. He was prompted in this idea by the successful launching of the University of Chicago, and he believed that with an expenditure of something like $10 million, a similar venture with similar results could be initiated in China. I thought, he wrote a few years later, that we might ourselves perhaps establish in China a university teaching no religion but hospitable to all faiths, a university in fact and not in name only, teaching all that is taught in Western universities, offering itself as a model for the Chinese government and raising up teachers for the new Chinese education. It was partly to explore this idea that Gates induced Mr. Rockefeller to finance the Oriental Education Commission, headed by Dr. Burton, which, as we have seen in a previous chapter, made an extensive study in China in 1909. The report of the commission convinced Mr. Gates that his plan of a great university was a dream not then possible of realization. The missionary bodies at home and abroad, he wrote, were distinctly and openly, even threateningly hostile to it as tending to infidelity. On the other hand, not even Mr. Rockefeller's promise of $10 million for an endowment could tempt the Chinese government to tolerate our proposed institution, freed though it was from all religious bias, unless we could consent that it be controlled and run by appointees of the Chinese government. One interesting thought that popped up for me here is why do you want to be so... Sh why do you really want to make sure it's free of religious bias? Because um, to me that, you know, religion for all its faults, it does keep people, it gives people a moral system, you know, that's part of what it does. Uh, and so to me, it kind of sounds like, well, if we get rid of the religion, <laughs> we don't have to worry about any moral, uh, you know, questions, do we? We can just do whatever we want, run whatever experiments we want. I don't know, though. that could just be me projecting onto it, but they're very. In it's interesting they're adamant about it not being religiously affiliated. The study by the commission of the sort of schools China was actually trying to establish disclosed incompetence so universally and dishonesty so frequently as to make any considerable Chinese influence in the conduct of the proposed institution out of the question. Thus, where we awakened in 1911 from our dream of a great Chinese university with a foundation of $10 million. Two years later, Rose's spectacular demonstration of what could be done with Hookworm and the extension of his campaign on a worldwide scale started Gates on a fresh line of thinking. Quote, Our plans for the spread of scientific medicine and sanitation, he wrote, give our interest in China a new and more promising direction. Might we not do in medicine in China what we failed in our attempt to do in Chinese education? Uh, so they went. Uh, so they went for education first, uh, and uh, they got they got that plan poo pooed. And so they thought, well, we'll go for their we'll go for their medicine. <laughs> Under the stimulus of Gates, warmly supported by President Eliot of Harvard, who had had much to do with the establishment of the Harvard Medical School in Shanghai in 1911 the newly organized Rockefeller Foundation began to explore the possibility of developing modern medicine on a significant scale in China. As was customary in all enterprises in which Mr. Rockefeller was concerned, action was preceded by long and careful study and by seeking advice both from technical experts and from those familiar with conditions on the ground. To President Eliot, there was no better subject than medicine to introduce China, to China the inductive method of reasoning which lies at the basis of all modern science. He thought it would be the most significant contribution that the West could make to the East. Dr. Paul Munro of Columbia University stressed the same motive and pointed to the lack in China of any training in the spirit and method of observation and induction by which knowledge of the conditions of life around us is acquired, tested, and put to use. The principal difference between contemporary China and Western peoples, he said, was that China had 
at hand for immediate employment the legacy of developments in the natural and social sciences which it had taken Western civilization 400 years to accumulate. Many of those consulted felt that medicine would avoid the entanglements in religious, political and social issues involved in other approaches. The missionaries would welcome it, and the Chinese government would be hospitable. The lack of stability in China was, if anything, an added argument for acting at once. Quote, If we wait until China becomes stable, said Dr. John R. Mott, we lose the greatest opportunity that we shall ever have of dealing with the nation. The old Arab proverb comes to my mind, he added, that the dawn does not come twice to awaken man. So presumably it sounds like they recognized the opportunity to take advantage of the chaos. If you've got, if they had like a coherent, strong uh, political structure at the time, it would be harder to wiggle your way in there if they said no. But if there's a bunch of factions all going at it and all vying for control and influence and power, power in different areas, then you can find a group that'll work with you and fund them and support them and, and get in that way, can't you? That's kind of my interpretation. Order out of chaos. The general consensus was summed up by Professor Burton of Chicago. Quote, to promote the development of China along right lines is not to benefit China only, or this generation only, but to make an important contribution to the welfare of the world for a future of indefinite extent. So there's that. Uh, they've got the world in their sights. That is their target, isn't it? Uh, just checking out quotes. Yeah, good stuff. Heidi was asking, does he ever talk about the nefarious Rockefeller Institute? I'm not sure about that, actually. It's a good question. And Peter's talking about Bill Gates. Oh, I shouldn't say, I should, Jill Bates. <laughs> Goes uh, and, and runs tests on people in India, yeah. And uh, he's in trouble there, hasn't he? They've, they've kicked him out and have really got fed up of him. Anyway. Continuing, part two. With these high hopes and in this spirit, the work was undertaken. At Gates' suggestion, the first step was a survey on the ground and a commission headed by President Harry P. Judson of the University of Chicago was sent to China to determine where and in what manner medicine, surgery and public health could effectively be introduced. If the Burton Commission of 1909 can be called the first commission, this was the first medical commission, Roger S. Green, United States Consul at Hankow, and a brother of Jerome D. Green, the secretary of the foundation, was a member of it, as was Dr. Francis W. Peabody of the Harvard Medical School. Traveling by way of the Trans-Siberian Railway, the commission visited 17 medical schools and 97 hospitals in China. Visits were also made to universities and secondary schools, both missionary and governmental. Conferences were held with the leading officials of the central government and of the various provinces, and with scores of medical missionaries of the 18 provinces in China, the commission visited 11. This detail is necessary to understand the scope of the study and its determining, determining effects on the later actions of the trustees of the foundation. It outlined the method of approach and the medical and social background against which the work would be done. The recommendations of the commission involved five principal points. First, it confirmed the idea that medicine was the most effective approach that could be made to China. Quote, the need is great beyond any anticipation and the opportunities for progress in all lines are equally great. Second, it emphasized the point that the work should be undertaken on a large scale with the understanding that it will involve a long time and that it should be Quote, on the highest practicable standard. Third, it strongly recommended that the project should be started at two points, in Peking and Shanghai. Fourth, it proposed that the teaching in the new medical schools, quote, for the present and for some time to come, should be in English as the main language, because of the lack of any body of medical literature in the Chinese tongue, and the impracticability of translations. Fifth, it suggested the immediate institution of a system of fellowships which would enable selected Chinese graduates in medicine to prosecute further study abroad and thus be prepared to assume responsibility in the new schools. So this 
uh, sort of sounds like and reminds me of the Rhodes scholarships where the recipients will be very carefully selected and groomed for these positions of influence and authority uh, later down the line. Less than a month after the receipt of the Judson Report, the trustees of the Rockefeller Foundation established the China Medical Board as an integral part of the foundation's structure analogous to the International Health Board, which had already been created. At the suggestion of Gates, Dr. Wallace Buttrick of the General Education Board was made director, a position which he reluctantly accepted on a part-time basis. The choice was a happy one. Quote, no one can do what he can do to make it go, said Judson. And Dr. Welch later spoke of the rare good fortune in capturing Dr. Buttrick to give his wisdom, personality, and wonderful executive ability to the work of the China Medical Board. End quote. At the same time, Roger S. Green was appointed resident director of the board in China, another happy choice which brought to the service of the foundation a former State Department official who had a wide and intimate knowledge of the Far East. One of the initial problems was the relationship of the proposed new activity in China to the medical missionary organizations which were already in the field and which were doing the best work then being done. Protestant missions alone were maintaining over 300 hospitals in China. Dr. Elliot, who had studied their activities firsthand, was impressed by their ideals and devotion, but their resources were always inadequate, he wrote. And under such conditions, both men and women are overworked, deteriorate, deteriorate in their own technique and become callous to the disastrous conditions under which they are compelled to treat their patients, end quote. As the news of the plans of the foundation in China began to spread, it was inevitable that uneasiness should develop in some sort in some of the missionary bodies. It was at this point that the tact and judgment of Dr. Buttrick showed to the greatest advantage. He knew intimately the personnel of the missionary societies and in many long conferences, both in the United States and in England, he was able to persuade them that the proposed development of medicine in China was in harmony with the common aims which they all shared. It was not intended to supersede, but to supplement what was already being done. Indeed, the plans of the China Medical Board involved, as an integral part of the program, the idea of direct financial assistance to promising medical enterprises in China. And beginning with Buttrick's administration and continuing through the administration of Dr. Vincent, who succeeded him as director of the board in 1918, aid was given over many years to strategically situate medical schools Sorry, aid was given over many years to strategically situated medical schools and hospitals, for the most part under missionary auspices, to improve their buildings and equipment and to increase the number of their doctors and nurses. In addition, a system of fellowships was developed by which capable medical missionaries could return to the United States for further training in institutions like Johns Hopkins, Harvard and the Mayo Clinic. Later, a similar fellowship plan brought missionary doctors to the Peking Union Medical College. It is not too much to say that all this varied auxiliary assistance, which amounted to approximately $1.5 million, helped to sharpen and unify medical missionary effort in China. It stimulated, at many points, higher standards of medical practice and thus increased in hospital constituencies the level of support for medical care. But in the early days, there seemed to have been anxious moments in the relationships with missionary groups. One missionary body, in a public statement, declined to accept aid, quote, until it could be determined whether the Rockefeller assistance would in any way interfere with the complete control of our institutions, end quote. Buttrick, writing to Roger Green in Peking, commented philosophically, quote, I do not worry much about this because the General Education Board has been suspected of unworthy motives through all the years of its existence. People have always suspected Greeks bearing gifts, and they will continue to do so until the end of time. Nevertheless, a little later, Buttrick wrote to Gates, quote, I would give several pairs of old shoes, and that is a real sacrifice, if you were here now. I need support. Precious shoes. 
The main objective of the China Medical Board, however, was not to scatter its aid over a wide area, but by establishing its own medical institutions to concentrate its efforts in a convincing demonstration. In 1915, therefore, after long negotiations, it purchased from the London Missionary Society the ground and buildings of the Union Medical College, which the society owned and operated. It was around this centre and on this site that the great Peking Union Medical College was erected. Buttrick, however, was not satisfied that the technical aspects of the project had been fully canvassed, and later in the year, a third commission consisting of Dr. Simon Flexner, Dr. Welch, Dr. Frederick Gates, a son of Mr. Gates, so there's some nepotism right there, and Dr. Buttrick himself spent five months in China, examining the situation on the ground. While the conclusions of this commission were in harmony with the general plan of work already adopted, much valuable light was obtained on concrete aspects of the work to be done, and a more adequate estimate of the magnitude of the task was made possible. For one thing, it was discovered that, if a first-class institution was to be established, provision would have to be made for the training of pre-medical students. Coming from their own universities, Chinese students were not prepared for the first-year work of a modern medical school. Out of this consideration developed an extensive operation by which, for many years, the China Medical Board financed pre-medical education not only in Peking and Shanghai, but in other Chinese centers as well. An unforeseen byproduct of this operation was its widespread influence in raising the standards of science teaching in the colleges of China. And we've got a little footnote here. It should be noted that between 1929 and 1935, the Natural Sciences Division of the Foundation contributed to Chinese universities and institutions, sums totaling a little under a million dollars to support the teaching of the sciences related to pre-medical training. This was supplementary to the work of the China Medical Board. Another point that the Commission underscored related to one of the objectives of the new institution. It must aim to put the responsibility for medical education in the hands of the Chinese themselves at the earliest possible moment. As Dr. Welch observed, the speed with which the Chinese accepted scientific medicine as their own and the rapidity with which the board's importance in the field diminished would be the measure of success. The commission also returned with a renewed emphasis on quality. The job must be superlatively well done. The training that was offered must compare favorably with the training given by the best European and American medical schools. Quote, We must create the Johns Hopkins of China, said Dr. Flexner, and in a public address which Buttrick made shortly after his return, he said, quote, our best service will not be rendered by aiding a large number of schools to train men imperfectly for the immediate needs of China. The greatest service we can render is by establishing these two schools at Peking and Shanghai on such a high plane scientifically and educationally that there shall emerge young men and women capable of studying the medical problems of China, of producing a medical literature, and themselves becoming the teachers of the next generation of Chinese in the very best that modern medicine can offer. To that task, we propose to set ourselves. So their idea for setting up a uni um, uh, education, a university, was knocked back, but they're still going ahead with training teachers. Uh, so they're getting in there one way or another, aren't they? Uh, and um, and the, the part of the story that I feel like is missing is that they... Um, what was being replaced? What what there must have been systems and practices and methods, methodologies in place to keep people healthy uh, in China at the time, because everywhere has that. Whether it's some sort of herb, herbalism or Chinese medicine, which I have to admit I don't really know much about, uh, but there must have been some sort of some sort of healing medical healthcare paradigm that was replaced by what the Rockefellers were teaching. And, and they're saying, well, we're spreading science and it was, we were doing a good thing, but they're not mentioning about uh, what was lost, you know? Uh, so I thought that was key. I would like to know that. Oh, hello. We've got Cosmos. Good evening, sir. And David Schwimmer is white. And I, I welcome. I don't think I've seen you in the chat here before. So I'm very happy to have you here. And um, thank you. Yeah, the so but this is well you've probably figured out by now this is like chapter uh 7. 
Uh, but there's a playlist on the channel. Uh, if you go to playlists and then you can see all the previous videos in this series, uh, we're just reading it from cover to cover. So there's quite a lot. You might want to go to the uh, saved videos and stick them on 1.5 speed if you can tolerate my voice uh, slightly sped up. Um, yeah, good to hear that you're buying books. The Monsters of Babylon, The Tyranny of Human Rights and Decline of the West. They sound very interesting and and uh, useful to have. Good on you for stocking up on books. Uh, Heidi has a quote here from an Orthodox saint which says, look into the abyss, then have a cup of tea. <laughs> that is a good one. I like that a lot. All right, awesome. Let's carry on. So part three. Meanwhile, the building operation in Peking was moving forward. The interruption of the First World War created discouraging complications, but by 1921, the vast plant was completed at a cost of $8.283 million. It comprised 59 buildings located on 25 acres. The project included laboratories for anatomy, physiology, and chemistry, a pathology building, a hospital with 225 teaching beds and provision for 30 private rooms, a nurse's training school, a large outpatient department, a hospital administration unit with quarters for resident physicians and internees, an auditorium, an animal house, dormitories for students and faculty residences grouped in two walled compounds. Besides those structures devoted to school and hospital purposes, it had been necessary to supply facilities which are ordinarily connected with the operation of a municipality, sewerage, water supply, and electric light. So they're really going above and beyond here, aren't they? Uh, putting sewage, sewerage, uh, electricity, electric light. They're making it very comfortable. They're making it very prestigious. And uh, you can see how they're wrapping the, the... They're wrapping a sort of what, like a, a, a luxuriousness around this this pursuit of, of becoming a, a, a doctor trained by the West and the Western medicine and the, the model, right? So the, 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 the native healers, the local healers who probably worked with the herbs and the plants that grew in that region and, and with the foods that grew in that, in, in that region, they probably live in huts and shacks and little <laughs> grass. I don't know what, okay, I don't know what they live in over there. I don't know what their buildings are like, but you know, they're probably living in something a little more, uh, rustic and old school, old style. And then the Rockefellers come along with their shiny new buildings and their elect electricity and, and they're, uh, they're just popping up these compounds. And, you know, if you get selected to go there, you're going to be treated like not like royalty but you're going to be treated really well you know there's there's bonuses and benefits and so it's it's really like a almost like a propaganda campaign as well wrapped in to get this new medical paradigm uh into that country in a very deep way so you could you know the young people who would go through that natural process of rebelling against the uh, older generation and their ways they would be really attracted and drawn by by all this shiny stuff that the Rockefellers were building and and these scholarships they were handing out. You know that would be a real, and they would probably be encouraged by their parents because they would see it as a way to earn money and 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 become wealthy. And the culture over in the East is uh, in Asia generally is a little more pressure on the young children to work hard in order to look after the um, parents in later life. Uh, that's kind of been phased out in the West, uh, in a way you kind of just stick your, your old f folk in, in a home somewhere, <laughs> but over there, there's a real strong sense in the young generations to be responsible and to earn enough in order to take care of their parents, you know, in later life, which, you know, is multi-generational household is kind of a much more, um, authentic and true to our human nature sort of way of living. I think so. I don't know, a little diatribe there. Um, Christine, hello. Thank you for joining us tonight. It's really nice that we've got some new people in the chat. Lovely to have you here. Uh, cutting through, you you found us through Cutting Through the Matrix. Yeah, uh, we've got a, that's Alan Watt, uh, Cutting Through the Matrix, uh, his website, his videos. Melissa, his wife, is continuing to post them to YouTube and BitChute. And there's also a study group on Telegram, which is a fascinating reservoir of information and knowledge. So great to have you here, Christine. And to everyone else, uh, check out Alan Watt because he's very uh, 
strong inspiration for me and what I do. And he's, he's, he did, he did incredible work. He really did. All right, let's carry on with the book. Three. Meanwhile, the building operation in Peking was moving forward. Oh, hang on. I just read that bit, didn't I? <laughs> uh, while the interiors of the buildings were planned to afford maximum convenience and the latest improvements in arrangement and equipment, the exterior was designed to be in harmony with the best traditions of Chinese architecture. The high, graceful, curved Chinese roof of jade green glazed tiles made in the factory that once supplied the tiles for imperial palaces had already given the college the name of the Green City. Grey brick was used in the structure, similar to that in the Great Wall, and the eaves were embellished with conventional Chinese decorations painted by native artisans. All this elaborate and somewhat expensive design was employed against Gates' strong protests as a symbol of the desire of the board to make the college not something imposed from an alien source, but an agency which would fit naturally and harmoniously into the picture of a developing Chinese civilization. It reflected, too, the anxiety of the board. In this first gesture to the Far East, to give China nothing but the best, it must be recorded, however, that in protest against what he called its extravagance and folly, Gates resigned from the board. Ah, interesting that they, they made it in the style so that they would get presumably more approval, uh, uh, but they used the, well, it just said, like, they actually did build it like they treat the people like royalty, you know? <laughs> I said earlier, oh, they were treating them like royalty. Not really, but yeah, they were actually using the same uh, style and the jade green glazed tiles that were used in Imperial Palaces. So they actually were going above and beyond all out in this, in the building of these compounds. The dedication ceremonies were held in September 1921, although the school had been opened two years earlier while construction was still underway. It began with a student enrollment of 140 and a teaching staff of 67, of whom 17 were instructors in the pre-medical school. 25% of the teaching staff was Chinese, almost all of whom had been trained in the United States or in Europe. The balance of the staff was recruited from countries all over the world and represented the best that Western experience could produce. From the very start, the school did not aim to turn out numerous doctors and nurses, Chinese institutions had to assume that task. But to train leaders in medicine and nursing who would serve as teachers and investigators in Chinese medical schools, hospitals and health organizations. The institution, moreover, was from the beginning far more than an undergraduate medical school. It was a center of medical training and research carried on in the modern scientific spirit by well-trained men and women from many parts of the world. Here, graduate students, Chinese physicians, and medical missionaries on furlough from their stations pursued special studies, often with fellowships supplied by the China Medical Board. From time to time, too, intensive courses were organized in medicine, surgery, the clinical specialties, and the fundamental laboratory scientists for groups of doctors who wished to keep abreast of recent progress. In this manner, ideas, standards, and techniques were seeded all over China. Visiting professors from America and Europe shared in these courses as well as in other teaching and brought to the institution the stimulus of their ability, experience, personality, and prestige. Men of the caliber of Dr. Walter B. Cannon, Dr. Alfred E. Cohn, Dr. David Edsall, Dr. L. Emmett Holt, Dr. W. G. McCallum, Dr. Eugene Opie, and Dr. Canby Robinson to mention only a few from the American list, shared in the undertaking and helped to make the Peking Uni Union Medical College a rallying point for medical training and research for the entire Far East. Many of the younger American doctors who served in Peking returned to the United States to positions of influence and widening usefulness. Meanwhile, the plans for a similar institution at Shanghai had been reluctantly abandoned, a site for the new school had been purchased there in 1916 and a group of trustees had been chosen to administer the enterprise. But the First World War upset the calculations with steeply rising costs of materials and supplies. Experience in Peking showed that the Shanghai budget could not be kept within the limits planned. Indeed, the Peking school had already cost more than three times the combined amount of the original estimates for both projects 
And with the annual budget at Peking running close to $700,000 a year, the foundation felt that another school would represent too great a drain. Moreover, the difficulty of finding an adequate staff for a second school began to be more evident. And when this difficulty was added to the fact that the high standards of the Peking College were absorbing the total number of properly trained pre-medical students, and that Peking, therefore, would be able to provide for all qualified applicants for many years to come, the impracticability, the impracticability of the Shanghai plan became obvious. LJ is saying that she loves herbs and it's lost knowledge. Herbs and Health by Nicola Peterson is good. Also, the Hedgerow Handbook by Adele Nozadar. Thank you for those recommendations, LJ. Um, yeah, these things, they're growing. I mean, when you think about it, right, all medicine comes from plants, <laughs> yeah, but you can't patent a plant and you can't um, charge people for it because it just grows naturally. You can't patent nature, you know. Uh, copyright laws don't allow that. So they have to get the plant and then just process it and extract whatever the compound or the molecule or the active ingredient is, uh, and you know, and then um, and then they can patent that, patent that and charge people for it and get people hooked on it and then you've got a business model <laughs> but uh yeah if if it just grows in the dirt and you can grow it at home then it's not a very profitable business model is it just give someone some seeds and then they've got a never-ending supply of healing medicinal herbs that they can use to to help themselves so i'm uh i think those book recommendations would be very valuable for sure and lj uh are they are those books uh dealing with a specific region of the world. That would be good to know as well. Heidi says they can patent nature now. Many, many patented plants now. Really? Huh. Is it, is it because they're, they've been genetically modified? Um, my understanding was if, if it's been genetically modified, then it, then you can patent it because the, you know, it's been part of it's been created by a human and that's the that's the prerequisite for a patent. But I might be wrong there. All right, four. The main emphasis of the China Medical Board, therefore, was centered on Peking, although contributions in modest amounts continued to be made to other medical enterprises throughout China. The Peking Union Medical College had been granted a provisional charter by the regents of the University of the State of New York and functioned under its own board of trustees with the China Medical Board acting in a supervisory capacity. Up until 1928, the China Medical Board was merely a subdivision of the Rockefeller Foundation. In that year, at the instance of the foundation, the board was dissolved and a new corporation was established under the name of China Medical Board Incorporated to serve as an independent American organization for holding and distributing funds for the promotion of medical education in the Far East or in America. The land and buildings in Peking were transferred from the foundation to the ownership of the new board, and the foundation gave the board $12 million as an endowment fund for the support in its discretion of the Peking Union Medical College, or for other indicated purposes related to medical education. This action was prompted by the desire of the foundation to lodge the ultimate responsibility for the financing of the Peking College in an organization separately incorporated and wholly outside the foundation. While it was foreseen that annual grants from the foundation might, for a number of years, be necessary to supplement the income of the China Medical Board Incorporated, so that it could adequately support the Peking institution, it was frankly hoped that other sources, perhaps Chinese, could be found for this purpose. These hopes were not realized. The invasion of China by the Japanese in the 30s, and particularly the tragic consequences of the Second World War, completely altered the situation. Immediately following Pearl Harbor, the Japanese seized the plant of the Peking School, and it was not recovered until 1945, during these years, Dr. Henry S. Horton, the director of the college, who had been associated with it from early days, was imprisoned by the Japanese in Peking together with another officer of the institution. The faculty and student body were widely dispersed throughout China. The School of Nursing was reopened in West China Union University in Chengdu, and some of the medical students continued their work in the same institution. 
Medical education was also carried on in other places in the area, and during this confused and unhappy period, the China Medical Board Incorporated appropriated $1.8 million to the National Institute of Health and to 13 government and mission schools to maintain the traditions of medicine in China and repair where possible the broken links of the chain of training and professional skill. With the close of the war and the return of the plant in Peking, serious questions were presented. Although the buildings had suffered no material structural damage, much equipment had disappeared, and the lack of maintenance and upkeep over the years had resulted in serious deterioration. Moreover, the country was torn by a civil war with little immediate prospect of stability. Excuse me a second. In 1946, therefore, the Rockefeller Foundation joined with the China Medical Board in sending to China a commission under the chairmanship of Dr. Alan Gregg of the foundation staff. The commission reported early in 1947, and as a result of its recommendations, the foundation made a final grant of $10 million to the China Medical Board, Incorporated, thus bringing its endowment fund to a total of $22 million. Including this endowment, the foundation's total expenditures for the erection and maintenance of the Peking Union Medical College and the stimulation of medicine in China have been $44,944,665, the largest contribution which the foundation ever made to a single objective. Now, there's a very interesting factoid to take away with you um, at this time. So this book was written 1952. And at that time, the largest contribution this foundation had ever made was to the establishment of uh, medical Western allopathic medicine uh, in China to the tune of almost $45 million. Commenting on this latest grant, the president of the foundation in his annual review of the work for 1947 made this comment, quote, it may, seem, it may seem an odd moment in the history of the world, and particularly in the history of China, to make a fresh investment in the development of modern medicine in that unhappy country. But the graduates of the Peking Union Medical College are bringing their healing techniques not only to needy men and women, but in a deeper sense to a human society that is desperately sick. In dark hours like these, it takes perhaps a leap of faith to believe that medicine can be one of the bridges across the gulf that separates this frightened present from a saner and better balanced future. We shall, of course, need other bridges, but modern medicine bringing us a conception of common human need that overrides our irrational and suicidal differences can surely help. End quote. Meanwhile, the China Medical Board Incorporated now a completely independent organization with its own trustees and officers, is empowered by its charter to extend financial support not only to the Peking Union Medical College, but to other like institutions in the Far East or even, indeed, in the United States. How about that? Um, part five, I think. Yeah. Monsanto Frankenseeds, says Peter Estrada. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so Heidi's saying, I'm a gardener by trade, and it's a challenge to find bedding plants without illegal to propagate. When those plants pollinate with others, they spread their pattern. When they say we will own nothing, they mean it. Yeah. I, I, they mean the own nothing bit. I don't think they mean the, the like it bit. <laughs> Hello, Ashley. Yeah, welcome. Have... Ashley's saying, have you ever seen Predator? I'm going to have me some fun. Is that the first Predator film with Arnold where uh, he ends up defeating the monster with like a like a log trap that he builds in a swamp, if I'm not mistaken? It was quite a surprising ending. All right, continue with the book. Five. Since 1947, of course, even darker hours than were anticipated have come to China and to the rest of the world. The communist government of China has taken over the responsibility for the school in Peking and reports as of this writing seem to indicate that it is receiving adequate financial assistance. Whether its high standards will be maintained, 
or along what lines it will be developed, no one, of course, can foretell. In attempting to estimate its usefulness during the three decades of its existence, it can be said with assurance that it had a profound effect on the development of modern medicine in China. In the first 20 years of its operation, until it was closed by the Japanese, it became one of the leading centers of medical training in the world. It was the outpost of teaching and research in the Far East, a symbol of high quality and objective approach. Indeed, in helping to establish the value of scientific method and inductive reasoning, it represented perhaps the most acceptable gift with which the West could have offered the East. During this period, it became an integral part of the intellectual life of China. It was welcomed with unstinted enthusiasm. Over 40 years ago, in a lecture at Stanford University, William James said that a college should be a place of intellectual ferment. That phrase describes with vivid accuracy the institution in Peking. Up until Pearl Harbor, less than 10 of all its graduates had gone into private practice. All the others were absorbed in medical teaching, in hospital posts, or governmental medical positions. They had been exposed to an intellectual ferment, and they had a new gospel to preach across the length and breadth of China. Yeah, so that's the, uh, that's the, the new gospel of scientism. It was the gospel of modern medicine, scientism, <laughs> germ theory, and the conception of what it could do for a people who had never known it. A survey made late in the 40s indicated that six of the national medical schools of China were under the leadership of graduates of the Peking Institution. And six other medical schools were headed by individuals who, although not graduates of the college, spent many years as members of its staff. Another significant development in the years after 1921 was the rapidity with which highly trained Chinese doctors had been able to take over the responsibility for the teaching positions of the Peking College. When the college opened, as we have seen, only 25% of the teaching ad and administrative staff was Chinese. By 1927, the figure had risen to 67%. By 1947, it was practically 100%, with two or three exceptions, all the important posts in medicine and surgery alike were filled by fully competent and experienced Chinese. What was true of the technical staff was true also of the Board of Trustees of the college, which, with funds provided by the China Medical Board in New York, had the complete responsibility for the administration of the institution. When the college board was first created in 1916, it did not contain a single Chinese this situation was due in part, at least, to the fact that the early promoters of the work had no acquaintance with personnel in China. In 1947, with the exception of two or three foreigners who were resident there, the board was completely Chinese, chosen on a self-perpetuating basis, and the full responsibility for the management of the institution was in its hands. Dr. Welch's test of the measurement of success mentioned on an earlier page the speed with which the Chinese accepted modern medicine as their own had been largely met. The troubled fortunes which have swept over China in recent years have clouded perspective and given rise to deplorable recrimination. We hear much of Western imperialism and American colonialism and the greedy interests of capitalism and all the well-worn labels of abuse. Perhaps in some less hysterical day, with clearer visibility, the Peking Union Medical College will appear as it really was, the best that Western civilization had to offer to a people whom it profoundly admired and in whose future it deeply believed. It was a gift inspired by no motive other than a desire to promote the welfare of man, men. The point of view of the Rockefeller Foundation was expressed in the statement it made on the occasion of its final grant to medicine in China in 1947. Quote, the trustees of the foundation are proud to have been associated in the founding of an institution whose contribution has been so significant and whose continuance means so much to the future. And they would take this occasion to rededicate it to the new generation of China in the firm belief that the light which it started in modern medicine will not be allowed to die out. Wow. <laughs> Pretty enlightening chapter i would say particularly in light of uh the big c event and where that all started 
it would be interesting to know if the um, laboratory in the uh, Hu Huan, <laughs> we'll call it Hu Wan, uh, the Hu Wan province, uh, which allegedly had the leak. Uh, if if the funding of that and the creation of that has any history that ties back to uh, this this uh, what was it forty five million dollars that the Rockefellers. Uh, invested into china to get their um medical colleges and systems up and running but incredible isn't it just to have the admission there that yeah we put 45 million dollars into this country to train people up who would then go on to to influence the next generations and the next generation so it, it reveals a lot about how it's done how a culture and a history because because i'm sure that the chinese had their their culture and history t very closely tied up with their medicine and their healing practices and and the chinese um uh, method whatever it is and consists of but it it's it's kind of like overwriting that and, and installing a new uh paradigm that competes with it and uh, with the ultimate goal of making it obsolete you know, uh, and I think it's quite insidious when you sort of view it from that lens, but surprising as well. Why would, with all the problems and issues going on in America and all the philanthropy <laughs> that you could get done there, why focus on China? Why put all that money over there? Uh, so let's have a quick review of the comments. Um, yes, we got... Oh, I read that about Predator... There's a new gospel indeed. Yeah, so they're, they even said the word gospel. That was quite surprising to me that, that that's the new gospel that they're spreading. But it is. It's become like a religion these days. Scientism, follow the science. Trust. I say it all the time, but it, it's become a religion because people just take it on faith and they don't investigate it and uh, analyze it and think critically about it. It's just like, well, I'll just outsource my well-being and my health to the guy with the white coat and the clipboard uh, down the the medical center and I'll not bother actually taking it into my own hands and doing some learning and maybe running some experiments and maybe uh, changing my nutrition or my exercise levels or the you know the the EMF frequencies around me or getting out in nature more it, it's more just like well I'll just take the pill it's much easier to just take the pill and believe that it's going to help me <laughs> rather than take the responsibility to make those changes for yourself, you know. Peter says, they believe nothing of the sort. They always know what they are doing. Yeah, they definitely had a plan, didn't they? And LJ is saying, why China indeed? Well, I'm not sure. But maybe, you know, that maybe what we've seen over the last four years is part of why they picked China. Maybe there is a, a continuity that goes back and then a hundred, so a hundred years ago, you've got the Rockefellers putting forty-five million into China, and a hundred years later, you've got videos of people, uh, you know, falling face down in the street, getting spread around the world, and we all get locked in our homes and uh, threatened with, you know, unemployment and um, never being able to travel. So there is some link there, uh, but I'm sure the history of that whole intervening hundred years would be quite complex and hard to uh, wrap your head around, but very interesting to know that the Rockefellers were there at the beginning, I think. So I'm just going to have a sip and then we can do another chapter. And then we'll call it a night. Two chapters is, has been a good pace, I think, for this book. Two chapters per video seems to work quite well. So the next chapter is eight. And this is medical education in the United States. It was not alone in China that the foundation helped in the development of modern medicine. In a series of bold moves in many countries around the world, it lifted the problem of medical education to a new plane. Here again, as in the development of the foundation's public health work and in its China program, it seems to have been Mr. Gates who first initiated the undertaking. It was what he called a pregnant idea and he threw his influence behind it with all his characteristic enthusiasm and intensity. The time was, he wrote some years later, and we can all remember it when medicine was under such difficulties and in such darkness that the enthusiastic young men who committed themselves to it pretty soon found themselves in one of two categories, either confirmed pessimists, disappointed and chagrined, or else mere reckless pill-slingers for money. 
just as Osler's book on the principles and practice of medicine had stirred Gates' imagination and had led to the creation of the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research, so it was another book, Medical Education in the United States and Canada, that now captured his alert and eager mind. The book was written in 1910 by Abraham Flexner as a result of a study he had made for the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, and it was one of the great landmarks in the history of modern medicine in the United States. Mr. Fe Flexner, himself not a doctor, was the brother of Dr. Simon Flexner, head of the Rockefeller Institute, and he had the keen, razor-like mind that characterized that remarkable family. The boldness of his thinking and the tenacity of his opinions frequently created antagonism, but he had an intellectual energy and drive that were to have profound consequences on contemporary medicine. He had personally investigated all the medical schools in the United States and Canada, 155 of them, and in his book, he described them one by one with an objective frankness, letting the reader draw the necessary inferences. Not more than half a dozen of the schools were able to give their students anything approaching an adequate medical education. Many of them were nothing more than casual associations of local physicians. All that such schools required, Flexner pointed out, were a few practitioners to serve as professors and a few bones. Laboratories were either non-existent or unsatisfactory. Clinical facilities, in the rare instances where they existed at all, were too often limited to precarious relations with hospitals, the appointments to which were made on almost any basis except education and science. To make matters still worse, there were low entrance standards or practically none at all. Of the 155 schools, 16 required two or more years of college work for entrance, 50 demanded a high school education or its equivalent, 89 asked for little or nothing more than the rudiments or the recollection of a common school education. In the majority of the schools, students' fees went directly to the instructors and the curriculum was apt to be short and ungraded. Dr. Simon Flexner, describing the medical school he entered in 1887, reported, quote, It was a school in which the lecture was everything. Within the brief compass of four winter months, the whole medical lore was unfolded in discourses following one another, following one another in bewildering sequence through a succession of long days. Unless the wisdom imparted should exceed the student's power of retention, the lectures were repeated precisely during a second year, at the end of which graduation with the degree of Doctor of Medicine was all but automatic. In his introduction to Flexner's report, Dr. Henry S. Pritchett, president of the Carnegie, oh, we, we said it before, Carnegie, Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, made this comment, quote, For 25 years past, there has been an enormous overproduction of uneducated and ill-trained medical practitioners. This has been in absolute disregard of the public welfare and without any serious thought of the interests of the public. Overproduction of ill-trained men is due in the main to the existence of a very large number of commercial schools, sustained in many cases by advertising methods through which a mass of unprepared youth is drawn out of industrial occupations into the study of medicine. The inadequacy of many of these schools may be judged from the fact that nearly half of all our medical schools have incomes below $10,000, and these incomes determine the quality of instruction that they can and do offer. The Flexner Report produced an immediate and profound sensation. It touched off a, ran a reform movement which was already in the making. Several years earlier, the American Medical Association had set up a council on medical education which was working persistently to improve standards, and even before the Flexner Report appeared, the growing demand for more adequate laboratory instruction was cutting drastically into the profits of the poorer schools. Moreover, increasing recognition was being given to the value of having medical schools attached to universities as fully integrated departments. As Pritchett said in his introduction to Flexner's report, in the future, the college or university which accepts a medical school must make itself responsible for university standards in the medical school and for adequate support for medical education. The day has gone 
the day has gone by when any university can retain the respect of educated men or when it can fulfill its duty to education by retaining a low-grade professional school for the sake of its own institutional completeness. The conception of the medical school that had slowly developed at the few good institutions like Johns Hopkins and Harvard involved a four-year graded course, the first two years devoted to laboratory subjects, anatomy, physiology and pathology, the last two years to clinical subjects such as medicine, surgery and obstetrics. For satisfactory results from the first two years of such a graded course, three things were necessary. Adequate facilities, well-trained teachers devoting their full time to their work, and a competent student body already equipped with knowledge of biology, physics and chemistry. For the clinical years, the last two of the four-year graded course, the need of adequate hospital facilities was being increasingly recognised. Adequate, in this connection, meant that the hospital should be readily accessible to the medical school that it should be equipped and organised as a teaching hospital and that the staff should be under university control and selected with some measure of participation by the university. 2. It was at this turning point in the development of the American medical schools that Flexner's book fell into the hands of Gates. The story goes, perhaps apocryphal, the Gates invited Flexner to his office and asked him what he would do for medical education in the United States if he had a million dollars. Flexner replied instantly that he would give it to Dr. Welch at Johns Hopkins. No answer could have suited Gates better, for he had a partner before with Dr. Welch in the planning of the Rockefeller Institute and the Rockefeller Sanitary Commission, and he was a great admirer of Welch's shrewdness, courage, and judgment. In any event, Flexner was borrowed from the Carnegie Foundation and was dispatched to Baltimore to make a survey on the ground. Complicated events were to occur between this simple assignment and the results which ultimately followed, but the trip to Baltimore launched the General Education Board and the Rockefeller Foundation on a program in medical education in the United States to which in the end the two boards contributed more than $100 million dollars and which, although at times it caused vigorous controversy, altered the pattern of medical teaching across the country. I wonder if we'll learn more about that vigorous controversy. It was the General Education Board that took the initiative in the project, and most of the money came from its funds rather than from the foundation. In 1913, Flexner joined the staff of the board on a permanent basis, and thereafter the leadership of the program in the United States was largely in his hands. The approach to the problem, which Flexner developed with Gates and Welch, was outlined in the autumn of 1913 in a formal resolution that the General Education Board, quote, address itself in the first place to the establishment of full-time clinical departments in selected institutions possessing adequate facilities for the inauguration of this innovation. The term full-time, as strictly construed under this resolution, was to mean that the clinical departments in the last two years of the medical school curriculum were to be under the administrative control of physicians or surgeons who would give all of their time on a university basis to teaching, to research, and to the care of patients in the teaching hospital. If, in order to further their teaching or their research, they saw private patients the fees for such service would go to the university. In the autumn of 1913, when an application was received from Dr. Welch for funds to make possible this completely new type of clinical teaching at Johns Hopkins, a sum was voted which would provide a yearly income of $65,000. The undertaking was frankly called an experiment. Ever since its founding in 1893, the Johns Hopkins Medical School had run its laboratory departments, anatomy, physiology, pathology, on a university basis, with instructors giving full time to their work. Under the new plan, now to be put in operation, the full-time scheme was to be tried in the clinical branches. These at first involved only medicine, surgery and paediatrics. Later, a number of other subjects were added, including obstetrics, psychiatry, ophthalmology, the history of medicine, preventive medicine, and radiology. The launching of this new type of medical instruction created a furore not only in the ranks of the medical profession, but in the lay press. 
emphatic protests were voiced that this scheme would deprive the public of the skill of outstanding doctors. Nor was the plan installed at the Hopkins without some internal, internal difficulty. As Dr. Welch observed, the full-time experiment involved, quote, such radical changes in conditions which now exist and have always existed in medical schools, both here and in Europe, that entire agreement of opinion as to the wisdom of the change is not to be expected. Nor can the plan be carried out without some hardship to individuals and some disturbance of personal relations. By and large, however, the enthusiasm of those backing the undertaking ran high. More than satisfied with the promise of this initial venture at Johns Hopkins, the board, over a period of six years, voted funds for similar reorganizations on a full-time basis of the medical schools at Washington University in St. Louis, at Yale, and at Chicago. All its contributions in this field were invariably conditioned on specific funds being raised from other sources for the same purpose. This was the approach to Nashville, Tennessee, where, with, with Chancellor, Chancellor Kirkland's statesmanlike cooperation, the board developed at Vanderbilt an outstanding medical school to serve the South. As Flexner later stated, the first appropriation to Vanderbilt of $4 million, later increased to $17.5 million, acted like a depth bomb, hastening the mortality of inferior schools while those that were determined to survive made rapid plans to enlarge their resources and elevate their arms. Before this last large-scale plan came into full operation, however, the board's scope in the area of medical education was vastly increased by new gifts from Mr. Rockefeller. Up to this time, the board had financed this program from its general funds. Between 1919 and 1921, Mr. Rockefeller gave the General Education Board $45 million dollars earmarked for medical education in the United States. Oh, excuse me. This chapter is incredibly dry, like my throat. Three. Although, hang on, what was that bit that I did want to comment on back here? Uh, the, um, this, this controversy about, so, so it sounds like they're getting the experienced doctors to focus on teaching the up and coming junior doctors, which means there's only inexperienced or junior doctors left to actually treat patients. So I think that was my reading of what the, what the controversy and the public, uh, the, the, the lay press were, were unhappy with, but also, uh, interesting here that, uh, they're talking about hastening the mortality of inferior schools, and I wonder if those inferior schools just also happen to be teaching uh, different modalities of healing and different different uh, methodologies of of promoting health and well being, you know, such as herbs or exercise or nutrition. Um, but of course, he's not going to tell us that. They're just inferior schools. Part three. With resources thus augmented, the board enlarged its area of work. The annual report for 1919 to 1920 reiterated the view that the full-time scheme had been undertaken in an experimental spirit. Its cost had been found to be very great. It would be a serious mistake to leap to the conclusion, cautioned the report, that the scheme should be universally adopted at that time. And the report added, quote, while experience thus far sustains the presumption based on a priori consideration that the system is worth the price, it still remains to be objectively proved that teaching, care of the sick and scientific production are all so much better under the full-time scheme that universities generally should move to its adoption, end quote. The board indicated that while aid would be continued to institutions already in the lead, attention would also be given to other schools. It was felt that medical education in all sections of the country needed to be stimulated and improved. And it frankly recognized that there was useful work to be done in helping communities strengthen the best their medical schools provided. Regional needs were given particular consideration. In the East, the officers pointed out to the board soon after the 1919 gift had been received. Quote, Medical education is altogether in the hands of privately endowed institutions of learning. With the exception of some eight or ten schools, 
Medical education in the West and South is in the hands of state universities. The board has found it practicable to cooperate with endowed institutions in developing their medical schools. It has had thus far no experience with state or mun municipal institutions in this field. It is evident, however, that if Mr. Rockefeller's benefaction is to be made generally effective, cooperation with state and municipal universities is necessary. In line with this thinking, Flexner brought before the board a proposal to assist the University of Iowa in moving its medical plant across the river to a site where a new teaching hospital with its necessary laboratories could be built. Without such help, it was believed that years would elapse before the state could be persuaded to undertake so ambitious a plan, and consequently medical education in this key section of the Middle West would be greatly retarded. The proposal, which involved $2.25 million to be contributed jointly by the General Education Board and the Rockefeller Foundation, met with Gates' determined opposition. In one of the stormiest meetings of any of the Rockefeller boards, he fought the proposal single-handed with all his characteristic intensity. With passionate gestures and with his white hair in disarray, he seemed like an old lion at bay. The state universities, he declared, were creatures of politics, subject to dictation on economic and scientific questions. It would be against public policy for a cent of Mr. Rockefeller's money to be given to them. The best service which could be rendered them would be to protect them in freedom of teaching by throwing around them in every state a cordon of strong, free, privately endowed colleges and universities. This was in 1923, and Gates did not understand the progressive forces which, even as he spoke, were converting the great state universities into the social and scientific laboratories they have become. Flexner's point in rebuttal was conclusive. We are fortunate in this country in having two types of institutions, one under private and one under state management. We not only escape bureaucratic uniformity, but we obtain a wholesome competition. On the medical side of the question, his argument was this. We are trying to aid in the development of a countrywide, high-grade system of education in the United States. If we confine our cooperation to endowed institutions, we can practically cooperate only in the East. So they're trying to standardize education, it sounds like. It was one of Gates' last appearances at a, at a board meeting. As an expression of protest, he resigned from the executive committee. And although he was not the type of man to allow differences of opinion to affect his personal relationships, thereafter he had little confidence in Flexner. One of the last thoughts he confided to his private papers before his death was about bureaucratic officers usurping the power of the board. Following the grant to the University of Iowa, similar gifts, although in smaller amounts, were made to other state medical institutions, including the University of Colorado, the University of Oregon, the University of Virginia, and the University of Georgia. An appropriation was also made to the University of Cincinnati, a municipally controlled institution. In each of these cases, the purpose of the board was to expedite developments which undoubtedly would have occurred in time, but which might have been unconscionably delayed. In the difficult art of giving, <laughs> to hasten the arrival of the inevitable is sometimes the height of statementship. Because the board had always been interested in Negro education, one of the major questions with which it was now confronted was how to provide the most effective opportunities for the training of Negro doctors. Over a period of years, it extended liberal support to the Medical School of Howard University in Washington, D.C., a private corporation receiving a large proportion of its aid from the federal government. But it was to Meharry Medical School in Nashville, Tennessee, that it finally gave its chief cooperation and help. A private organization supported for many years by the Freedmen's Aid Society of the Methodist Church, Mihari seemed to be the most promising center for a significant development. Consequently, with board funds, a new site was purchased close to Fisk University and new buildings and laboratories were erected. The board hoped that some kind of an affiliation would be established between Fisk and Mihari 
and as part of its medical program, it strengthened the science courses at Fisk through grants for that purpose. As a matter of fact, affiliation was not achieved, but proximity and daily association resulted in cooperation with regard to such matters as laboratory and library facilities. Even more significant was the strengthened stimulus felt by each institution of scholarly standards and of the scientific spirit. The board's aid to Mihari totaled more than $8 million and the school not only achieved a stable high rating, but developed into a wide regional center for the professional preparation of Negroes in medicine, public health, dentistry, and nursing. But it was to be but it was to the development of the full-time plan in key institutions that the board devoted the major part of its resources. Obviously, said the officers, all medical schools could not be substantially assisted. Obviously, money would have to be massed at strategic points. This was in accord with a policy which ran back to the days of Mr. Rockefeller's personal philanthropy, a policy of building on strength rather than on weakness. Make the peaks higher, Rose used to say, by which he meant that as the standards in first-class institutions were progressively raised, the radiating effect would spread not only through an entire region, but across an entire country. Sounds like trickle-down economics. <laughs> the influence of a Johns Hopkins or a Chicago would in the end reach every campus and every medical school in the United States. Consequently, in the years following Mr. Rockefeller's new gift, the General Education Board, occasionally with the participation of the Foundation, concentrated its efforts in medical education in places like Harvard, Columbia, Cornell, Tulane, Western Reserve, and Rochester. Incidental aid, sometimes in substantial amounts, was given to many other institutions like Duke University, Emory University, and the Memorial Hospital in New York. But the major policy of the board was to avoid scattered assistance and to mass its support behind strength or political or potential promise. In the midst of these activities, it became increasingly clear that compared to the importance of the trained men for teaching and research, endowment, buildings, and equipment were merely accessories. As schools raised their teaching standards, the demand for qualified men was rapidly increasing. For years, a similar need had been felt at the Rockefeller Institute, where Dr. Simon Flexner was deeply concerned that men should be found and developed who would continue the Institute's scientific leadership. His views were shared by board and foundation officers who were working for improved medical education. Competent men were not going into academic medicine because they were financially unable to support themselves during the prolonged period required to equip teachers and investigators. To meet this need, therefore, as far as it could be met, Appropriations were made by both the board and the foundation to the National Research Council for a system of fellowships to aid men qualified for academic careers in medicine. These fellowships have been maintained to this day, and their influence on the development of the medical sciences in America has been attested over and over again. All right, part four. Surveying the General Education Board's experience in medical education over the decade and a half, which is 1913 to 1929, in which the program was in active operation, it is evident that full time was the point upon which opinion continued to be sharply divided. Undoubtedly, insistence on university standards for clinical departments served to swing the pendulum away from low and timid educational practices. It did more. It helped to swing the whole movement for improved medical training into top flight effort. At the same time, there were those who felt that insistence on strict full time was an unjustified intrusion on university policy, and several trustees of the foundation and of the general education board, as well as outsiders, were deeply disturbed. Dr. Elliot wrote to Buttrick on the subject, referring to, quote, The policy of the board, which I heard stated with great distinctness by Mr. Gates when I first joined the board, and have often heard since, not to interfere with the domestic management of an institution aided, except as regards its prudent financial management. I observe in the memorandum you handed me a desire or purpose to condition a gift from the General Education Board to the Harvard Medical School on the acceptance by the school of one method of introducing the full-time policy. 
This condition does not seem to me consistent with what I have always believed to have been the wise and generally acceptable policy of the board. Buttrick's reply was based on a distinction between grants for general endowment and for specific kinds of work. Quote, In making appropriations to colleges and universities for general endowment, no restrictions have been imposed other than that the sums contributed by us should be preserved inviolate as endowment. In making appropriations upon the request of colleges and universities for specific departments or kinds of work, the board has naturally, and I think wisely, so made its appropriations as to ensure the carrying out of the programs under which and for which the contributions were made. End quote. And it cannot be doubted that many thoughtful people besides Buttrick and Flexner felt that the only sure way to attain the high standards for which the board was aiming was to insist on strict full-time as a condition of aid. Nevertheless, the policy came under increasing criticism. Anson Phelps Stokes, in his capacity as a board trustee, wrote in the summer of 1924, It is not a question of whether we are right or wrong in our opinions regarding the university or full-time basis of medical education. I think that where adequate funds are available, we are absolutely right in favouring this policy, and I am very proud of what has been accomplished by the board under Mr. Flexner's leadership in the field of medical education. But it is a question of whether or not we can psychologically and morally afford, in view of public opinion and our great wealth as a board, to be imposing or at least requiring detailed conditions regarding educational policy in medicine in elaborate contracts which can only be amended with our consent. Personally, I think this policy unwise and fraught with serious dangers. Taking all these points of view into consideration, the board modified its policy in 1925, authorising the revision of contracts with medical schools to permit such modification as educational and scientific experience might, in the judgment of each school, justify. Some schools to which the board had given money continued on a strict full-time basis. Others modified the plan. As these modifications were developed, they generally took the form of what is now called geographical full-time. Under this plan, the school or hospital provides the professor or physician with his office rent-free and there he conducts all his consultation work and practice. This has a considerable advantage in centralising his work and the work of the department to which he belongs. A staff member on geographical full-time is either paid a fairly substantial salary and allowed to keep an, om an amount equal to this salary out of the fees he collects, the surplus being turned over to the university, or he is paid a small nominal salary and allowed to keep all his fees. Dr. Alan Gregg, reviewing the whole situation in 1950, made these three points. Quote, 1. By its emphasis on planned professional teamwork, Full-time clinical teaching has paved the way for an important form of practice today. Group practice, with its economical use of costly diagnostic and therapeutic machines and instruments. 2. By diminishing the obligation of young professors while teaching to build up an extensive local private practice, the full-time system has opened to them a much larger choice of posts over the country and has thus favoured the growth, advancement and dissemination of able young men. Entire regions of the country can benefit from talent that otherwise would have stayed in eastern, eastern metro metropolitan centres. 3. Few, if any, young men trained in full-time departments would now vote for the part-time teaching system. And what young men prefer has vitality for the future. The decision to work for improved medical education brought the board and the foundation into contact with new educational techniques. Quote, We ourselves never pretended to have an original idea, said Flexner later, but we knew educational strategy. The revolution thus accomplished brought American medicine from the bottom of the pile to the very top. And indeed, it was a revolution. It was a vast pump-priming operation, geared to an ambitious idea. The hundred million dollars contributed by the two Rockefeller boards, matched many times over by the generosity of scores of citizens like Rosenwald in Chicago, Eastman in Rochester, and Harkness in New York, took the teaching of medicine in the United States from the discreditable position it occupied in 1910 
and gave it a status which it shares with only a few other countries in the world. As controversy arose over theories and methods, the two boards clarified and broadened their own thinking. So again, it'd be good to know what theories and methods are uh, being questioned here. Maintaining an inquiring and flexible point of view, they adapted their procedures to developments that their own initiative and experimenting helped to bring about. But their fundamental aim remained always the same, to throw their weight behind the improvement of medical education in the United States. This involved difficult policy decisions as well as ingenuity, resourcefulness and persistence, intent on helping to develop the best. It is fair to say that the foundation, and particularly the General Education Board, had a firm hand also in defining and strengthening what the best might be. Although at the close, that's pretty, that's pretty critical as well, there, isn't it? It's fair to say that the foundation and the general education board had a firm hand in defining what the best might be. So they're setting the criteria by which to measure intelligence and success and achievement and what is a good career path to go into. They're really shaping the culture here um, and linking the academic sphere in with the with the medical sphere and just think about how how much it's pushed on us that uh, it's a good noble thing to want to be a doctor and you always see it on television tv shows and films there's a young child what are you going to be when you grow up i'm going to be a doctor or you see uh tv shows like scrubs or i don't know gray's anatomy before that what was the george uh clooney one er all these dramas kind of uh, making doctors to be heroes and to have a certain kind of life and really try and push into the minds of the viewers this idea that it's a kind of a noble, worthwhile, fantastic thing to get into. And then, of course, once you've been through all those hundreds of thousands of hours of training and learning and all the money that you spent and the debt that you've racked up, and all the grueling sort of uh, residencies and placements that you've been through, when you finally qualify, it's going to be very, very difficult. It would take an immense strength of character to then turn around and be courageous enough to, to question that whole paradigm that you've now been indoctrinated into so thoroughly. It would take an immensely strong personality to do that. Um, so once you're in it, it's going to be hard to get out, isn't it? So, but this is kind of them admitting that they shaped all that and built all that system and they got to decide, uh, what was it? They got to decide defining what the best might be. Although at the close of the 20s, not one university in the United States possessed what could be called a complete medical school offering all the specialties, the General Education Board felt the sub, sub, such substantial progress had been made in medicine education over the period that its efforts would thenceforth have greater significance in other fields. Before this time came, however, the foundation was to extend the drive to improve the training of doctors until it touched many of the leading centers of the world. And that is the end of chapter eight. And uh, so we've had medical education in China. We've had medical education in the States. Guess what's next? Med medical education around the world. So that's chapter nine, which we'll be carrying on with on Thursday. At the same time, seven o'clock on Thursday. So that chapter was kind of dry, um, but shows you what they were going for in the establishment of the standards and the, and, and creating the it was kind of like they, they almost created that mythos. I mean, I don't know. It'd be really interesting to know how they recruited, how they, uh, was there any um, marketing? How was word spread? You know, was who was involved in that, that side of things, getting people to go into the profession and the medical profession? Because, you know, it sounds great what Fosdick's writing here. They really uplifted it and they made it into something that had standards and something that was to be respected. It doesn't really say exactly and specifically what they changed and, how, and what was going on beforehand, which I think uh, is it keeps popping up for me. was like, well, what were people doing in terms of health and healthcare and medicine before this? 
uh, and it doesn't talk about that so much. It just kind of alludes to or suggests that whatever was going on was was uh, immoral or or stupid or not worth preserving or or holding on to. So uh, interesting chapter. I'm sure you would agree. Raymond Fosdick does have another book about. Um, I think I sh I think I showed it uh, on one of the earlier videos, it's, and it's all about the general education board. What is it called? I'm, I'm looking it up quickly now. We'll just we'll just quickly have a look at it because it's worth reminding any new viewers. Um, it's something like ad that's it. Adventure in Adventure in Giving. That's the book really really quite pricey so if i just uh quickly hit this so on book book finder you, if you go in for raymond b fosdick you can find adventure in giving the story of the general education board uh there's two copies and they're each over 300 quid which is nuts <laughs> really is nuts isn't it uh yeah they haven't even got a picture of the book there so you can't even look at it but um, yeah, so that would be a great one to get hold of, I think. Uh, but it exists and it's out there and it's, it's one of those books that you, you might find in a secondhand bookshop or, you know, a thrift shop or the book shelves at the back of church. Any of these places, like there'll be copies of that sitting around somewhere uh, and you never know when you're going to get lucky and be able to grab something for, for, a, for an absolute bargain. When it's sold for that kind of price online, it's worth just having a list of these books in your head and these authors in your head that you can um, uh, you can keep an eye out for when you go trolling those secondhand bookshops if, if you're into that sort of thing as I am. So I hope that was a useful video. I enjoyed it very much. I am glad to be back and on. Uh, we're going to try and establish a regular sort of weekly uh, drumbeat of, of, of live streams because as you can probably see there... <laughs> this is this is how much we still got left to read we're not even halfway through yet and this is part five this is this is, we're in like we're at 10 hours at this point reading this book so maybe i need to uh go easy on the on the preambles <laughs> but anyway let's have a quick review of the comments and then we will close it out uh so what's going on here lj had to leave oh well i hope uh when you do catch up that uh you had a lovely evening Peter says, boule. <laughs> and I don't know why. I don't know what that means. Boule. And then there's a bit of French going on. Heidi says, so much meddling. One thing I have learned is that the best criteria for medicine are retention and compliance. Also, is this meaning the people who um, get re who who become practitioners, like the students, uh, the the ones who the ones who comply and keep showing up uh specialities ignore holistic health yeah yeah so that's that's part of what we've had what we've got now isn't it we've got people who are experts in one part of the body or one condition nobody's looking at the system as a whole and certainly very few people are looking at this the, the the even bigger picture as in like you as an individual in the timeline of your life in the uh social unit of your family your workplace your friends uh, and your country, right? All this stuff plays into it and feeds into it. But instead, we just get people who are very specialized and they're unable to um, get things on the... They, they think they don't see connections between things. And, and that's kind of, I think, been done on purpose, probably largely due to the general education board, <laughs> just to train people out of being able to make uh, connections to things and, and uh, you know, particularly interdisciplinary connections. So people are very specialized in their knowledge and they know lots about a very specific thing but they can't really describe how relevant that is in a bigger picture and how it connects to other things so yeah that's definitely part of the problem um all righty so yes good well uh gwen says very interesting uh i'm glad you thought they were interesting i was getting a bit sleepy in that second one there <laughs> but we will crack on on thursday so thank you very much for being here as always um if you ever want to support you can always check out the links underneath the video that is where all the stuff is plenty of stuff to have a look at there i uh, hope you enjoyed this video 
Take care of yourselves and each other until I see you on Thursday at seven o'clock. I hope you have a lovely week and God bless.